What do you see? <clears throat> I can feel you pulling things around in there. It seems to be some small sort of uh, endocrine gland. About the size of an adrenal gland. Small. That's disappointing. It's not very dramatic. <clears throat> it's a brand new organ. Never before seen. And it's functioning. <sighs> can you feel it? I wrote this script 20 years ago, and for various reasons it, it didn't get made, which is common enough. But about three years ago, maybe four, uh, Robert Lantos, the Canadian producer, said to me, you know, David, have you recently read your old script, Lives of the Future? And I said, no, why would I do that? And he said, well, I really think you should, because I think it would be a great movie. And I said, I'm sure it's completely irrelevant. And he said to me, no, it's more relevant than ever. Now, the movie is not primarily a climate change movie or a, an environment movie, but there is an element in there. In the 20 years since I wrote it, the whole question of microplastics in the ocean, and then literally about a month ago, uh, the discovery of microplastics in the bloodstreams of many, many people around the world, and the discovery of microplastics in the flesh of almost a majority of people. This is quite shocking and quite stunning. And the question is, you know, what does the human body do with this? Um, can we survive it? Is it reversible? All of these things. have tried very hard to, to work with the same people as, as often as possible. And Carol has been really the foundation of that. I mean, I think we've worked together for almost 50 years now. She understands me. She understands things that I will not be interested in. We, we are very efficient. But we are also very playful, you know. I mean, when we just realized that we were going to shoot in Athens as opposed to, let's say, Toronto, we embraced the city of Athens and everything that that brought us. The opening shot of the movie is not in the script. And it was something that we discovered as we were looking at locations. And I was saying, what is that? Why is that? Why is this enormous ship on its side in the water? And they said, well, it's been there for like 20 years. I said, you must be kidding. So I said, Carol, you know, and she said, yeah, yeah. We immediately knew it had to be in the movie. And then, derelict ships became a kind of visual theme because we found other, there was a, what we call the, the ship's graveyard. Some of these ships had actually been sunk and were awaiting uh, prosecution because they had been used for smuggling drugs and so on. And they're huge, they're immense ships. And I thought, it's not rational, but emotionally it's so perfect for the movie. And it does set up a kind of tone and an otherworldly feel without it being a sci-fi invention at all. And that's the kind of found art that to me is always there in any movie you make. You can be as precise as you want, but even if you do storyboards, you have to allow yourself to be flexible enough to embrace what happenstance throws in front of you. Orchid Badazar. Top of the line bed. Once we correct the misalignment caused by your hormonal imbalance, you'll be floating. Part of the fun of the movie and part of the essence of the movie was to create machinery that was designed to help these humans deal with their mutation. For example, the hormonal balance just change, your relationship to pain changes. So you need a special bed that constantly is moving and shifting as you move and shift in your attempts to sleep, for example. And originally in the script, it was called a spiderweb bed, and it was more like a spiderweb. And when we tried to design it, Carol and I, I realized that it, it was innately flawed, that, that visually it was just not going to work. It was going to have all kinds of different connotations. We had already designed the Sark, which was meant to be a kind of insect-like version of a sarcophagus. 
that design was working out quite well as it had been des described in the script. So I said, well, okay, the bed has got to be more in line with the sarcophagus, the sarf. And so we started to look in a different direction and we called it the orchid bed. That is a bed that moves in concert with whatever's happening in the body of Saul Tanser. And then there's also a very organic looking chair that helps him eat and it moves as he's having difficulty eating. It's adjusting and trying to help him swallow food, or digest food, absorb food and so on. And so these are, these are these three basic machines. What I'm saying with that body art stuff is that I don't like what's happening with the body. In particular, what's happening with my body, which is why I keep cutting it up. Vigo and I have become very good friends over the years. And when I offered him the lead in this movie, he, he actually was thinking at a certain point he would play another role of Detective Cope. But uh, eventually I talked him into, <laughs> I coerced him, I badgered him, until he realized that he could, in fact, play the lead. With Vigo, you, you don't get just an actor, you get a full-on collaborator. He will comment on the script, he will comment on aspects of the script that don't directly have to do with his character, and he will discuss culture and all kinds of other things. He is a, he's a poet, he's a filmmaker, he's a publisher. So you, you get a, a a serious comrade in arms when you work with Vigo. It's not turning me properly. Yes, I heard you. A sleepless night. I will call life on right away. They are usually very responsive. What else? What else? The test cooked all night and we're ready this morning. There is a new hormone in your bloodstream. I originally uh, cast Leia Sadu as Timlin. I really find her to be a, a very intriguing, very emotionally accessible, but also very intelligent actor. And I was searching for another, perhaps older, different tone actress for Caprice. But I was having trouble finding that right actress for that role. And when Leia Sadu <laughs> heard about that, she said, you know, David, I really think I should play Caprice. And as soon as she said it, I thought, you know, you're right. I think you are the actor I've been looking for for this role, and I just didn't realize it. Oh, right, right. <laughs> She's right. I was thinking we could use it for our performance. We record the most intimate things. Sorry, but it is illegal. This department is not yet exist. And it was Kristen Stewart who ended up playing Timlin in the movie. So I knew that Kristen was good and had evolved hugely as an actress, but I didn't realize that she was brilliant. She surprised me many times on the set with what she was doing. Really, really lovely collaborator, a totally professional, funny. We had a great time. I mean, the whole, with all the actors, actually, it was a, a beautiful, you know, a beautiful experience. Do you think you would ever let me be a part of your show? Uh, just because I would love to find myself in that Sark module with you with the controls. I will attend that. We would definitely fall into that category of new race. Saul, as a performance artist, is raging against the fate of all humans, you know, I mean, not just death, but aging and infirmity and everything else. In the face of all that, he is still finding a way to try to control his fate through art. Is it pathetic? Is it hopeless? Is it noble? Is it rebellious? All of those things, you know. To that extent, I do relate very much to Soul Tensor performance artist, you know, uh, the, the idea that I'm trying to still, at this age, to understand the human condition through my art, and then I invite the audience to come along on that trip to see what they think.